welcome to a speech this evening um, from Martin Donnelly, well known to, I'm sure, many people in this room, Permanent Secretary at Biz. Um, we've been very keen um, to have a speech like this at the Institute for some time. Um, the issue of the civil service and how it runs and how it's governed is something that many people have opined on in this building. Um, we've had quite a few politicians on this stage talking about it. We've had a lot of former civil servants talking about these sort of issues. We've had a lot of serving civil servants talking about very specific issues around the things that they do in their job and work on. But I think this is the first time we've welcomed such a senior civil servant talking about the civil service itself and specific roles that it has. Um, so very, very glad to have Martin here tonight. Um, a few quick housekeeping um, points this evening. Um, this is, of course, as usual, a public and fully um, covered event, so anything you say is on the record. And when we come to questions and comments, I've asked people to identify themselves and their organisation. Um, the other thing is, um, anyone who wishes to tweet, we have a hashtag. I think we're on hash CS reform uh, for this evening's event. Um, and finally, the speech that Martin gives will be available on our website after the event, if anyone wants to go back and refer to uh, particular parts or passages inside it. Um, with that said, I'd like to welcome Martin Hiss, who is, I think we were, we were calculating on our um, Whitehall Monitor stati statistics, um, the third longest serving Perm Second post at the moment. There are prizes for guessing the other two names, which will be rewarded afterwards. Um, the, but Martin has, of course, had a huge career in the public sector, over 30 years' experience in numerous departments um, inside the UK and abroad. Um, so a wealth of experience to address the issue uh, and the, the speech, the title he's proposing tonight, which is Positive Neutrality and Trust, the Policy Role of the Permanent Civil Service. Martin, over to you. Thank you. It may safely be asserted that, as matters now stand, the government of the country could not be carried on without the aid of an efficient body of permanent officers occupying a position duly subordinate to that of the ministers, who are directly responsible to the Crown and to Parliament, yet possessing sufficient independence, character and ability and experience to be able to advise, assist and to some extent influence those who are from time to time set over them. Those resounding words date from November 1854, as many of you will know, when the Northcott Trevelyan Report on Civil Service Reform was presented to Parliament. They remain true today. I want to examine the justification for the provision of policy advice and delivery to ministers by permanent civil servants. That requires some prior definition of the issues. I also then want to argue that permanence and what I call positive neutrality are both more efficient and more capable of building and maintaining trust in the process of government than any likely alternative. It's important to start by stressing that a non-political policy civil service is of course only a small part of the central UK civil service and a <coughs> tiny part of the wider public sector. There has been a welcome focus in recent years on the importance of efficient and responsive public service delivery from health to tax to welfare. These are all vital and challenging tasks requiring specific expertise. <coughs> but I want to focus this evening on the central policy civil service function, often known for shorthand as Whitehall, though that's a, a virtual rather than a physical place these days, which works directly for and with ministers and is concerned with the development and implementation of government policy. Within this system, as you know, civil servants recruited by competitive examination and promoted within a system designed to reward merit and be independent of political or other external influences, principles set out by Northcott and Trevelyan 160 years ago, directly advise ministers. They, we, expect to retain their roles, including at the most senior levels, when ministers and indeed governments change. They do not take part in political debate, although they clearly influence its outcome by their advice and effectiveness. For policy civil servants, the notion of working for Her Majesty's government in support of the public interest as defined by ministers responsible to an elected parliament is still a real one. Northcott and Trevelyan changed the political climate 
which up until then had allowed rampant patronage across the public service, and their work led to the unified civil service structure we still recognise today. Much has changed, of course, since the 1850s, when Dickens was in full flight and gave us the circumlocution office in Little Dorrit, as a reminder that critiques of bureaucratic self-serving have a long pedigree. Most British adults then did not have the right to vote. But this system has, with some adaptations, served Britain over a turbulent 150 years, through wars, the introduction of full democracy, the welfare state, the end of empire, European Union membership, the rise of a knowledge-based service economy, and changes in the structure of the UK from Irish independence through devolution to today's constitutional debates. But it is right to look at whether this model remains the best option for policy governance in the second decade of the 21st century. It is certainly not sufficient in itself. Advice can be independent, but unhelpful. Implementation can be well-meaning, but of limited competence. Decisions can be technically correct, but fail to convince the public. And the experience of those inside the system can be too narrow or unimaginative to ensure an effective, joined-up response to new social or economic challenges. Nevertheless, independence does offer a promising starting point. When combined with a career structure able to reward professional commitment, it limits the attractions of telling ministers what they might like to hear, rather than offering a more objective assessment of options, their likely success and affordability. It allows experience, collective as well as personal, of effective policy making to be built up and drawn upon. It also provides a structure allowing frank discussion of options and priorities within a safe policy space across government and beyond. Of course, the permanent civil service must engage with external expertise in policy formulation and execution, encourage technical experts to join for short periods or a substantial career, Flexible structures have to be in place which make full use of their skill sets. But all of this inside a structure where impartial advice and critical assessment of delivery options can ensure sufficient trust among ministers to take official advice seriously. And the wider public have to trust that the process of government is being carried out to their benefit. Trust cannot be assumed and has to be earned both internally and externally. Baroness Honora O'Neill, whose seminal 2002 Wreath Lectures and subsequent work remain critical to any understanding of how to earn and maintain trust in a modern society, has commented on the extent of challenge civil servants and all those in positions of authority face in building and maintaining trust. And for Whitehall officials, the challenge begins at home, within government. It is not a given that an incoming minister, perhaps of a different political party, probably of a different temperament and outlook from his or her predecessor, should immediately trust official advice. So a key challenge for policy officials is to achieve and maintain that trust. To add value for ministers across government requires a relationship of mutual trust built on professional respect and evidence of competence and able to handle the pressure of events. The risk to good policy advice can stem not only from some private agenda, but from the temptation to become too close to the wishes of a particular minister. Civil servants must be politically aware and politically sensitive. Working in proximity to ministers and to parliamentarians leaves most officials with considerable admiration for the work politicians do in and out of government, for limited reward and often unfair criticism. Their task has become harder as the media has become more pervasive, more immediate, and with less time or space to explain complex arguments. Parliamentary speeches and debate no longer receive the public attention they once did. Against this background, it's important for officials to separate strong professional support for ministers from crossing the line to become uncritical personal commitment, which ultimately is unhealthy for both politicians and officials. Officials have to separate honestly held personal views from policy advice. Ministers appreciate clear advice, but they have a right to know it's based on their own political judgments, not those of an official. 
Ultimately, if an official is uncomfortable with the fundamental direction of policy in the area she or he works in, they may need to move to ensure the system can deliver the quality of service required by ministers. But to work effectively and achieve that mutual trust, we need to be explicit about the differences between a politician and a policy civil servant and clear on the appropriate behaviour of the latter. I'd identify three broad themes to guide official behaviour. Firstly, not to do for one minister what would not be done for another of a different party or outlook in the same situation. This Kantian approach allows wholehearted commitment but stops short of indulging personal preferences or crossing the line into political polemic. Providing a convincing defence of government policy should be a core Whitehall skill Rubbishing the opposition is not the function of permanent officials. Second, to avoid having to answer the question, why wasn't I told this might happen? By erring on the side of disclosure to ministers of everything that might take place. This must include challenging optimism bias, without allowing that challenge to become an excuse for inaction. We know, for example, that the timescale of policy delivery is a key component of a successful policy and needs as much critical scrutiny as the policy itself. It also includes ensuring a thorough evidence base for policy options and being transparent about the inevitable limitations of the evidence when time or other constraints require rapid decision making. Third, I suggest, to offer some advice that is not accepted. If ministers are never challenged, they are unlikely to be getting the best advice around an issue. If the boundaries of their views are not subject to scrutiny, they may miss the opportunity to change their views as the evidence changes. The desire to please ministers is rightly a strong motivator of policy civil servants, but it needs to be tempered by challenge, which in my experience good ministers expect and have a right to. Ultimately, ministers have the last word, so mutual trust requires the ability to offer conflicting views in the confidence that it will not erode that trust. This also applies within official structures. It's not always easy for policy civil servants working within a hierarchy to offer different or even opposing views to ministers where the same facts lead to different judgments. But it's part of our professionalism to ensure that rigorous analysis of evidence and judgments about likely outcomes do not level down diversity of opinion. And culturally, ministers can be more at home with internal disagreements than policy civil servants. Ensuring a genuine fair hearing for different options is a key role for senior civil servants in their quality control of advice to ministers. But I'd underline that any policy challenge must be within the framework of the government's overall political direction and provided with political sensitivity. And after decisions are made, they need to be implemented with professionalism, rigour and as much pace as is consistent with effective delivery. The gap between the press release and the policy impact on the ground is inevitably longer than would be politically ideal. A policy civil servant may need to draw on achieved trust levels to argue for slower, safer delivery on occasion, despite its frustrations. Equally, the challenge to deliver more, faster, with less resource must also be accepted and worked on professionally. So what then are the differences between officials and ministers? Well, obviously, ministers have democratic legitimacy in their own right, and officials do not. They can expect their work to be taken seriously, but ministers must have that last word. Officials are there to support them within the law and respecting financial proprieties laid down by Parliament. Those who are not comfortable with this reality do not have a place as permanent policy civil servants. Nor should wider society expect officials to be a break on the delivery of contentious political decisions supported by the democratic process. Second, politicians generally have a different, shorter time horizon. So there is a tension between the optimum time needed to prepare or revise a policy and the political need to announce and implement it, which has to be recognised. To caricature, politicians want what Churchill called action this day. Officials welcome more time to weigh the evidence and assess delivery options. Both are valid starting points. The value added comes in how they are brought together. Mutual trust between ministers and officials, accepting the legitimacy of these different approaches, makes it easier to find the best available outcome. 
recognizing the political constraints that exist, as well as the dangers that go with too rapid decision making. To risk a further caricature, officials are trained to see complexity and understand ambiguity. Policy delivery is difficult with costs, downsides and uncertainties, and often with wider consequences elsewhere in government. Without political leadership and explicit willingness to take risks, not many decisions could be taken. The opposite caricature is a desire to take immediate decisions and announce them without having thought through all the consequences, resource constraints and the scale of risks, particularly in medium term projects. Or to assume that these stubborn facts can be overcome through greater zeal and Leninist commitment by those within the system. In fact, both ministers and officials share a strong interest and desire to get things right first time, to communicate policy clearly, to explain the constraints of real world delivery and to get stakeholders on board. Policies often need improvement as they're being implemented. External circumstances change with implications even for successful policies. Resources can become more constrained so that further hard choices have to be made and things go wrong unexpectedly. Policy success needs to be judged against the evidence available at the time decisions are made and that in turn requires transparency and mutual support between officials and ministers. If that trust exists, the next step can be taken to justify a safe policy space for discussion within ministries and across government. We know that evidence policy making must be effective policy making must be evidence based. That requires engagement with experts and with those likely to be affected directly or indirectly. Most policy has financial implications and involves trade offs with other desirable outcomes, meaning there will be losers as well as winners. Policy involves value driven decisions, including on willingness to allow adults to run some risks, on levels of redistribution of income through the tax or welfare systems, <coughs> on legal protections or definition of crime, issues on which views differ and where debate can be helpful. There also has to be acceptance that no policy exists in isolation. Other government goals are legitimate and must be taken into account. In Isaiah Berlin's terminology, we have to be foxes rather than hedgehogs, not concentrating on one big thing to the exclusion of all else. Different ministries inevitably have different priorities for resource use and policy delivery. That's one reason they exist. Government collectively must produce a sustainable range of policies which balance competing claims for money, legislative time or delivery expertise. So policy officials must ensure that discussions or even arguments about policy trade offs take place across government on the basis of shared evidence and analysis within a structure that allows for private discussion to determine priorities which are then accepted and implemented. Northcott and Trevelyan were perceptive in identifying that this type of conflict resolution requires a united cadre of officials with mutual trust and a shared organizational structure. One key criterion for assessing policy officials is how they manage policy divergences between departments working with the coordinating role of the cabinet office and ultimately support cabinet decisions engaging collective ministerial responsibility. Preemptive publicity about potential decisions can be used to bias those decisions in favor of one or another group, can make evidence gathering more difficult in a highly politicized environment, or weaken the political position of a minister or part of government seeking to take a difficult but necessary decision as one element of a wider program. So transparency within the system should not be equated with automatic public openness of the decision making process. I argue that a private space for political debate within government is a necessary part of executive cohesion, which in turn ensures that government decisions are coherent across departments and over time and produces better outcomes. Clearly the trust officials need to deliver their value during internal policy or resource debate must be matched by complete discretion about how these processes reach a political conclusion. That discretion should in my view extend to subsequent memoirs or public commentary and go beyond strict legal requirements. It applies both to domestic and diplomatic officials. It is finally an investment in maintaining the relationship of trust for future generations of officials and ministers. But that relationship cannot and should be a monopoly on policy advice. 
Political advisors have a key role which can't be played by civil servants. Officials are not chosen for their ability to give political advice, and unsurprisingly, the evidence is that they're not as good at it as politicians. Political advisors add value through additional challenge to official advice, including suggesting new approaches, and their own advice on the politics and presentation of a decision. In my experience, they do this well because ministers know the difference between good and bad political input, and they function as part of the wider unified civil service structure. The crucial specificity of the British system is that political or personal advisers are not a separate layer of administration. In France or other companies, countries with a cabinet system, advice will go to the member of the minister's cabinet for approval and, if necessary, change before being sent to the minister, if indeed it is at all. Cabinet officials often have considerable decision-making powers in their own right. One implication of this system is that it requires many fewer junior ministers. Another is that interministerial coordination tends to function on two separate levels, political and official, leading to a higher risk of policy incoherence and conflict over resource decisions. The Whitehall model ensures that official advice is seen directly by ministers. Additional comments can be provided by special advisers and the minister's private office, but they do not change the advice itself. It is this direct access, together with career progression, which does not depend on ministerial patronage, which allows honest and occasionally unwelcome advice to be provided. It's up to officials to make use of this privilege wisely and for politicians to support it as the best available way to maximise their own real decision-making scope. A further consequence of the model is that policy officials have to work wholeheartedly for the government of the day. As I've said before, they should not be looked on as a break on politically divisive policy, nor expected to brief those outside government about policy disagreements or alternatives. If voters don't like policy outcomes, the answer lies in the ballot box, not in expecting permanent officials to take on a political role, however unpopular a government may become at some point in its mandate. This approach has implications for opposition politicians and again raises the issue of mutual trust between the different political and official cultures. Our system requires politicians not in government to distinguish between the policies they may abhor and the officials responsible for advising the government on how to develop and deliver them. It also requires officials shortly before general elections to prepare actively to support and implement policies which may be diametrically opposed to the ones they've worked on and defended in recent years. In my experience, policy officials achieve this partly by developing a professional culture of political detachment and occasionally ironic humour, recognising that elections do not change external reality, but also by enjoying the intellectual challenge of taking a new approach to issues. Personal familiarity between senior officials and politicians across the Westminster spectrum also helps to increase understanding of complementary roles. Achieving full mutual trust between officials and ministers must always be work in progress. And I think there is a case for some more joint training and team building between the political and official leaderships of departments and perhaps between permanent secretaries and the cabinet as a whole. But assuming that trust is substantially achieved, it's still only part of the solution. How do we convince a sceptical wider world, as well as commentators, business, the third sector and individual citizens, that Whitehall really is good for them, or at least better than any plausible alternative model? Honora O'Neill has identified honesty, competence and reliability as key requirements for trust. How do these apply to the relationship between a permanent policy civil service and the wider public? Honesty is probably the most straightforward. 150 years of public service tradition, allied to a rigorous system of audit and control through the National Audit Office and Public Accounts Committee, together with the personal responsibility of the accounting officer, traditionally also the permanent secretary, for funds voted by Parliament, give the UK a system which is the envy of the world in the honest management of public money. So criticism has focused more on issues of competence and reliability. Here, there is no room for complacency. Continued civil service reform remains crucial. As turnover of companies in the FTSE 100 shows, it's challenging to have to renew constantly the skills needed to engage effectively with a rapidly changing economy and society.
There's also a much greater level of transparency and media engagement now with civil service processes and decisions. O'Neill's wreath lectures interestingly make the argument that transparency itself has done little to build or restore public trust and notes that, quote, the press are skilled at making material accessible but erratic about making it accessible. From a policy civil service perspective, we need to be more assertive in helping citizens to assess available information about complex issues and programmes under scrutiny. Managing risk means accepting that things will go wrong, or certainly less than fully right. Being quick to acknowledge problems and any failings that have contributed to them, setting out the remedies being put in place, and learning lessons for the future. It also means celebrating success and communicating clearly what can be achieved with available resources to avoid unrealistic expectations <coughs> leading to disappointment. And it requires more proactive public communication. It's increasingly clear that much trust-related dialogue takes place across social media. Digital literacy is becoming a core skill for policy officials seeking evidence about policy impact and also seeking to engage with sometimes sceptical citizens directly. Ensuring there is a recognised area for officials to engage in this way, while respecting both political boundaries and their own private space, is a key challenge for the years ahead. So competence requires continued improvement, learning from best practice across the private and third sectors, and reviewing successful policymaking internationally. It also requires effective communication of risk management, explanations suitable to modern media of how and why decisions were made on the evidence available, and willingness to admit to, correct and learn from mistakes rapidly. Trust should come from public evidence of competence, which allows officials to operate without their ability to do so being a contentious issue on every occasion. When the necessary communication to allow outsiders to assess that officials are working effectively has taken place, the wider challenge of communicating policy itself is for ministers. It is, after all, their policy, and they are entitled to the credit for it. A public profile in itself is not helpful for Whitehall officials, any more than for the large backstage crew of a successful play. Ministers know that policymaking is a team effort, and it is important that officials do not come on stage except in specific and limited circumstances, such as parliamentary hearings. Otherwise, the critical distinction between political and administrative roles risks becoming blurred to the detriment of both. Trust is often best expressed implicitly through a lack of public <coughs> concern when everything is proceeding smoothly. To conclude, for policy neutral officials to add value in government needs a specific culture as much as a set of clear rules. It requires officials to deliver a strong professional commitment to ministers within mutually understood boundaries which separate them from political activity. Ministers, to accept the occasional inconveniences of this system, deliver them a better outcome for individual policies and overall government effectiveness over time than would come from a more fluid, less professional structure. Both to work together to deliver the best outcomes available in the political space and wider society to trust that it's getting a good deal. I believe that the British system is worth the effort to adapt and improve while keeping the basic distinction between ministers and officials simply because it offers most potential for good policy making and delivery. To maintain it though, we need to be assertive in explaining why this is so. The above thoughts are my personal contribution to that debate. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Martin. Um, and before, while people digest that very, very rich um, canvas that's been spread before us, uh, I thought I'd start with just a few questions and uh, bits for discussion. Um, I think you raised at the start, you said, um, looking at the model that we've seen for 150 years, is this the right model for now? And I think I can conclude that your answer was broadly yes to that question. Um, one or two sort of things in that before I come back to that yes. I think within that, there was a real emphasis on the competence and professionalism of civil servants themselves. 
Um, and you provide a few guiding pointers inside the, uh, the speech itself. I suppose the question I've got is, when it comes to understanding the quality of policy making that officials are engaged in, how do we help officials themselves understand what a professional approach in a given situation is? And is this as a merit-based system? How can they be clear that the people who are assessing them on their performance have the same understanding of what a professional response is so that the system works in that way? I think practical things that help civil science in those very tricky situations that you alluded to in your speech. <laughs> That's a very good, uh, very good and challenging question. Uh, I'll try and be brief because I hope in discussion our colleagues, uh, including uh, those who've worked in Whitehall or uh, either now or before, will add their own uh, insights on this. Um, it is true that the Whitehall culture has been and still is quite implicit. So if you like, there is something which is passed on through the system of um, what would have been called by the Victorians competitive examination, what we might call a promotion by merit, but very rigorous assessment, uh, and by ensuring that as people progress into leadership roles, they're getting those roles for having demonstrated the qualities needed to deliver effective policy making. Mm. I believe that we've got more explicit about that and we've mm. recognized perhaps more explicitly the importance of effective delivery and the skills that go with that and its link into mm. to policy. So I would say it was a key function of the civil service permanent leadership to pass on the torch, might be putting it in slightly too romantic language, but to continue to maintain a culture which is recognized by those dealing with it as essentially meritocratic, as objective as it is possible to be, and uh, based around some objective challenge internally and externally while constantly seeking to improve. And I think it's the job of the senior leadership of the civil service, particularly, but not just permanent secretaries, to ensure that takes place inside departments and across the civil service. Excellent. And just two more sort of quick observations before we throw it open to comments and uh, questions from the floor. Um, just on the, on the answer yes um, to the basic question, um, there seemed to be an assumption, and indeed explicitly you were saying, a private space is really necessary for this system to work and drive quality. <coughs> now, in other parts of the public sector, we actually have slightly different assumptions. So local authorities' policy advice would be um, to the council rather than necessarily to the leadership, and publicly so. Um, and if you're thinking about quality, surely having to defend your policy advice in public as to why this was the best possible advice could arguably be a system that would drive quality in our system. Um, I suppose what, what is it about <coughs> that attachment to the closed system of Whitehall do you think is really the, the key thing that makes it better than those other alternatives that we might think about? Well, I would uh, respectfully question your closed system of Whitehall. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel very closed from inside. Uh, we put huge amounts of, of information uh, out there and we work within the FOI system and so on. The point that I was trying to make, and I appreciate that it may not be an entirely um, popular one, is that there is a need inside government for a private space for decision making. Because essentially, much of government is about the management of conflict. There's never enough resource to go around. Uh, there's never enough parliamentary time. Uh, there's never enough policy expertise. And ministers are coming from different positions. And ministers are politicians. Now, handling all of that uh, requires s policy civil servants in many, though not all situations, to be aware of some of the political dynamics as well as, if you like, some of the uh, wider, more technical criteria and pull those together which is why I talked a bit about the political space we're working in. To give honest advice to a minister can involve giving an opinion on uh, some of those issues or where some other department may be coming from. That's a perfectly legitimate function. But if you try to do it uh, under the glare of publicity, it's not going to work, or certainly not work as well. It's also the case that people have been known uh, to use the media to emphasize a particular point of view in order to make the likelihood of a decision <laughs> greater, if I can put it that way. And it, you know, it, that may just not be the best way to reach the best available decision. So I would defend the importance of a private space without saying Whitehall should be closed. Of course it shouldn't. Mm 
But there are times, and the complexity of central government uh, is such that you do need to be able to do some of this uh, in a way which is protected from immediate public scrutiny. Excellent. Um, and final sort of thought on this, just in the sort of challenge to at the opening part of this. Um, we have a, a, a system, you talked about the policy of civil service quite deliberately, I think, um, but we also have become recognising much more the implementation side of policy over the last 20, 30 years, uh, at very least. Um, I was just wondering, is the system of governance that really grew up for policy decision-making, where the minister is the decision-maker, the same system of governance that is good for implementation of that policy, where usually the minister doesn't actually possess the skills and is in no way really the decision-maker, probably more in an oversight role. Um, so I suppose some of, the, some of the changes, I wasn't completely sure, some of the changes that we've had and people are discussing about senior responsible officers reporting to parliament and things like that, where would you sort of be on that? Is that helpful to the system uh, or is that something that doesn't quite gel with the, the way it works best? I think I would separate um, the issue of parliamentary scrutiny, which we've always had, which we've expanded and I think broadly successfully, uh, and uh, we might choose to expand again mm. from wider issues of who is responsible for what. And I think I would just pose two questions in this area. And you're right, it's a complex one. But it seems to me that the importance of uh, policy ultimately depends upon its implementation. It, the distinction is sometimes made a bit more glibly than it seems to me it should be. Mm. Um, and ministers are responsible uh, for that because it's important. And therefore, it's really about the wider quality of, of political debate. Um, nobody thinks that any Home Secretary is personally responsible for the fact that a crime has been committed, even though none of us want any crimes to be committed, and so on. There are some other areas where perhaps the level of um, public expectation of personal responsibility is unrealistic. So I think explaining what we can and can't do within the constraints becomes very important. But I would argue the current system gives us a clarity uh, of ultimate responsibility without uh, taking away from the responsibility of those involved in the implementation process. And Parliament certainly has a, an important role there. I think if you move away from that, uh, it gets very complicated very quickly and it's not clear you end up in a better space. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Um, right, I'll throw it open now to people for questions, comments, thoughts um, that uh, people have on what we've heard so far. Who wants to um, kick us off? That lady at the front here. There's Mike Wong coming, yes. If you could just say who you are um, as well. Uh, my name is Winnie Agbonlow. I'm a reporter at Civil Service World. Um, I've got two questions, if that's okay. Is that fine? Right. Um, Martin, you said, you said at the beginning that officials have to achieve and maintain ministers' trust. Could you go into how you think they should do that? And my second question would be, um, you said a lot of things that, in your view, should happen and must happen, and I wondered whether there were particular things that you feel aren't happening at the moment, and if you could go into detail into which ones they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, <let me> <laughs> thank you. Let me deal with the second one first. What I was consciously trying to do was move a bit upstream from some of the detailed debates and say, we have got a system. A lot of the justification for it has simply been because it's there or implicit. Let me set out a bit more explicitly why this system is worth having. And I'm conscious that ultimately, you know, like any other service business is a, is a metaphor you have to use with care, but let me try. Like any other service, if we're not delivering to the level expected by democratically elected politicians, then you know, something else will be put in its place. And that's a good challenge for us to have. And it feeds into your first issue. It seems to me we ultimately maintain trust by doing the job well. But that means explaining and making sure that ministers understand and want to buy into what that job is, uh, what it isn't, and making sure that they understand uh, why we are equipped to do it. Not in a monopoly and not uniquely, but, but what, what, what they're getting out of it. And I think we've got to explain that, but there are real skills in policy uh, making, policy implementation, policy delivery, uh, which I believe we do have. And that's what we have to offer. And that's what adds value. So I think it's just being clear and confident about what we have to offer 
without being complacent or without suggesting we've always done it that way. And as the digital example shows, there's a huge amount of change which we have to do. The reform program we've, we've got is not a very good example of that. But all of that's entirely consistent with these underlying principles of what we as permanent officials are trying to do and what we're not doing by not crossing the political line. Excellent thing. I might just take two or three uh, in the next round. Start work my way back. Sue, start off. Uh, Sue Street, a former civil servant. Um, thank you very much. I thought it was an incredibly thoughtful exposition. Um, I strongly agree with you about the, the need for private space. I don't think anybody who's had a difficult, honest conversation with anybody else at all can doubt that you need a, a degree of privacy and, and it's sort of in proportion to your independence and ability to uh, you know, tell a minister that some idea is barking. You can't do that if you actually accept that you're there to support them, if that's public. So I think that's absolutely uh, certain. The area where I felt a bit uncomfortable was the idea that you were defending the status quo completely. And I, I think the civil service has fallen down on the implementation side. And um, I'm not entirely sure that we shouldn't have a higher degree of personal accountability for implementation. But I'm certainly sure that we need a higher degree of competence in our commercial skills, whether it's managing contracts or many of the other areas, the IT. We're just not quite there. And I don't think it's fair to expect politicians to be personally answerable for things which are about the how. You know, we've decided the what together in the way that you suggest. But going away and doing it and making stuff happen, I think we, and I totally accept this uh, as a criticism myself as well, I think we need to be better at it for the future. Thanks, Sue. Uh, gentleman just now. Thanks. Uh, Alistair Smith, Competition and Markets Authority. In, in defending the current system, the implication would seem to be that it, it generally works rather well. But there have been, there seem to have been several instances in the current government where unhappiness with the system has surfaced in the newspapers. Uh, I'll resist the temptation to ask about universal benefit and ask you instead whether you've read uh, the colorful uh, blog by D Dominic Cummings about his experience as a, a special advisor in the Department for Education, where the picture that he presents of his view and therefore presumably the view of his Secretary of State was that when they came into the Department for Education with a, a vigorous program of policy, they encountered a determined obstruction on the part of their civil servants. And that doesn't seem to be a picture of a machine that everybody thinks is working well. Excellent. Before we run on to Dominic, um, I just, the gentleman there, um, just, yes, indeed. So I think that <coughs> rather follows on, uh, but looking at it the other way around. Uh, uh, Roger Dore, Better Government Initiative, but before that, 40 years in Whitehall. Um, another former civil servant, I'm afraid. Uh, and I agree, I would, wouldn't I, with uh, almost everything you've said. But I do wonder whether culture has changed somewhat and made the whole thing much more difficult. Just to go back a bit, 1970s, I worked in the Employment Department, just relations, pay policy, strikes, etc., where regularly governments changed and made a stand on our heads. I remember Michael Foote coming in in 74, and we stood on our heads on pay policy, industrial relations, and miners' strike. Uh, and again, then in 79, with Jim Pryor and then Norman Tebbit. Uh, and they took for granted that we would stand on our heads and work as enthusiastically for the incoming government as we had uh, for their predecessors on, on, with complete reversals in policies. And I'm not sure that is still there to quite that extent. And the second cultural change, uh, and I detected this uh, towards the end of my civil service career, uh, I'm not sure, and this wouldn't be true of all, but some ministers are so prepared to hear the arguments against what they would like to do. Whereas again, for most of my career, I would never hesitate to uh, tell them the problems about what they might want to do. Martin, do you want to come back on any of those? Uh, yes, uh, just, uh, just briefly, because I think it's a, it's a fascinating debate. And, and, and these are all important points on which there isn't a, anything like a last word, but we do need to grapple with. 
I, I agree, uh, Sue, that we should um, uh, not be complacent about our commercial skills and always aim to do things uh, better. And I think we've tried various models, and unsurprisingly, none of them are perfect. And we've probably got to go on trying and, and certainly raise our skill base. I note that the private sector has similar issues uh, in, in big projects very often. I think one of my challenges on this or questions is in many sensitive policy areas there is a constant looking at policy, rebalancing, changing it, uh, which uh, can be politically or parliamentary, uh, for parliamentary reasons driven uh, and civil servants have to, with ministers, make a judgment about the level of risk that's being taken. Uh, and I can think of specific examples on that where, you know, we have said to ministers, oh, we don't think we can do this in this time scale because the risks are too high. But it's a perfectly legitimate discussion for ministers to have and ultimately uh, for them to decide to take a higher level of risk than you know, uh, the officials closest to the issue might do. So I think we've got to recognise that there is this space around policy decisions which affect implementation, which it's legitimate for ministers to do. It's not fire and forget as we know, with, you know, you've decided it, now come back in X years and it'll, it'll all be done. So I think one does have to retain some political control <coughs> over that process, while I think one can have transparency, but also protection for people at the sharp end, so they don't feel if anything goes wrong, you know, their heads are going to be offered up. And I think it's one of our jobs as civil service leaders, as permanent secretaries, to uh, hold that umbrella, as I put it, over uh, our hard-working staff. Uh, uh, when uh, things go wrong for reasons outside uh, their control. I think that's also a, a point I'd make on the culture thing. Um, this is probably another very unpopular point, but you know, I think times have got tougher for civil servants, but they've got more tougher for ministers <laughs> and for politicians over the last 30 years. And you know, I do admire people who work in our political system because there are more kicks than halfpence. And uh, I think we as civil servants have to recognise that much more challenged environment in which politicians have to work in the way that we give advice. And, you know, life is just not as leisurely as it was in the 1980s. And I'm about to break my self-imposed rule of not mentioning yes, Minister, <laughs> and so I'm free. But, you know, I mean, there was much more time and, and much more space. And we, we, we just don't have that today, and that's how it is. Um, I haven't read Mr. Cummings' blog, uh, I have to say, but I do think that we have to recognise trust is work in progress. I would just say that, you know, I don't see determined obstruction. I see policy civil servants who do this job partly because they want to work for elected ministers. You know, they enjoy it. That's <coughs> and they like the feeling of being part of a team delivering public service, which may or may not change every five years. And, uh, and you know, that's one reason people choose to be policy civil servants. Excellent. Thank you. I'm just going to run back along this side, and then I've got quite a few people ready to come in. But I thought I'd start with Sue and then work back this way. Uh, sorry. Uh, Sue Cameron, Telegraph. Um, even if you leave aside uh, some of the thing, undesirable things that have been happening, civil servants being rubbished in the public prints by ministers, sometimes by name, uh, that is, and uh, you mentioned the education department and, the, and Dominic Cummings. And maybe even to if say you I hadn't read his blog. So yes, but even so, it's <laughs> the same spirit. Uh, isn't the real problem now for you, however desirable sticking to North Cotrevelian might be, that there are, is a real move among quite a few politicians, both uh, in the Tory party and in the Labour party, who want to revert to what you described as rampant patronage. Isn't your plea for North Cotrevelian too late? Okay. Can I just go right to the back, uh, gentleman there? Uh, James Kidner from the Foreign Office. Um, fascinating talk, and thank you very much. Um, I'm interested to know uh, the sustainability of this culture that you, that you describe very nicely with an increasing sort of permeability of all professions these days. Um, when you and I joined the civil service, we sort of expected to stay in it for life. I'm not sure that people these days join with that same expectation. There is a reasonable degree of confidence that you'll come in, do a few jobs, then go outside, then maybe come back. How 
How permeable is that culture, and what's the sort of critical mass at which point it's very difficult to sustain that nuanced sense of what it means to be a civil servant rather than what it can do to have oxygen from outside? Excellent, thank you. And then, actually, just at the front row. Just beside <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for um, uh, a really illuminating insider's view. Um, and bravo for talking about the trust word, which some people sort of denigrate uh, when some of us have tried to raise it. But um, I find myself feeling that there is something missing Every one of your individual propositions is a good one, but there's something missing from the totality of it, and it's probably because trying to dis discuss trust is very personal. It's about what you feel about somebody else and what somebody else feels about you. How much training do senior civil servants have about how to generate trust or, or to win the trust of ministers, because you talked a little bit about that, mm. but I have to say it sounded a little bit, it's a harsh word, manipulative. You know, you have to give them some advice that they're going to reject to show that you're challenging them. But I mean, th what, what seems to have happened in uh, recent years is that the confidence of senior civil servants to challenge ministers seems to have uh, reduced at the same time as ministers feel they're being obstructed even more than they used to be. It's a, there's an oxymoron in that, um, that double perception. Um, but what, given that we've got politicians who are much more short term, much more preoccupied with, with the sort of the thick of it um, political context, uh, don't the civil and senior civil service need to up their game about how they manage these very difficult and pressured people in order to hang on to really serious long-term things that a permanent civil service is there uh, for which you are there to be the guardian of? Mm. Thank you. Another set of meeting wow. questions. There's a very, yes. I'd like to sort of start a couple of our seminar around, around that <laughs> one in particular. Let me start with, with Sue. Um, I think so. All, all I say is, um, you know, let's apply John Stuart Mill here. Uh, I think let's put the arguments out there and let the best argument win. And all I'm trying to do is offer one perception. I'd only say that just because it comes from a serving civil servant of more than three decades standing doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. I <laughs> totally accept I come from a particular <laughs> angle, but I just want you and others to consider the arguments for, your, for yourselves. And that's yeah, that's all we can do, but on the whole, it's a better system than, any, than anything else. The permeability of culture point is another extremely difficult one. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that like any other successful organisation I've seen across public sectors, abroad, I deal with many businesses now, to be successful, they must have their own culture related to what they are doing. And that's true within departments inside the civil service, as we all know, as much as you know, the, the basic principles, civil service is not a vanilla flavoured whole, nor should it be, and it becomes even more true uh, when you get out into agencies, CMA, Ofcom regulators, and so on. People need different uh, cultures, but it's got to be built on, I think, the same base plate. Uh, I also think there probably is a point where if you've moved too many people too quickly, uh, y you lose that. I don't think we are near that. I also think it's important to emphasize the other way around. Uh, on, on, on my executive board, we have people with experience from private sector law, from uh, business, uh, and so on, from running universities. All that is really important, and, and you need it. But you, you do need to provide that framework within which people's diverse experience can be respected and used, but they're using it inside an existing framework. On the trust point, one image that, that, that came to mind, which is a bit dangerous, but I'll use it anyway, is we don't need to be ministers' best friends, and we don't need to like each other. I, if I go and see my GP, you know, I may not want to go to the pub with him for a drink, but I expect to trust his expertise in what he's doing. I wouldn't necessarily you know, 
take his advice on um, the 2.30 at Kempton Park. And I think Honora O'Neill is getting at some of that. It's, it's a relationship whereby we are trusted to deliver certain things, including challenging policy advice, which, which was more um, uh, to help uh, ministers, by the way, and decide that they definitely disagreed with that and to find their own boundaries than, than to show that we were sort of macho uh, when it comes to advice. I think, though, I would strongly agree with your point, and it's something... I think we, serving civil servants and recent civil servants, become more aware of, become, we become more senior. Uh, there is a relational element and uh, there is an element of emotional intelligence which you need to be an effective uh, leader in the civil service. And actually, I think in almost any organisation nowadays, and we need it with ministers. And ultimately, if that relationship totally breaks down, then the civil service has a very big problem. And you, know, you have to look at what you're going to do about it. But, that, but I think within that, there's no reason why you know, ministers shouldn't like some officials more than others, knowing that that has nothing to do with how good the advice is or whether they're going to be promoted or not. So I think I, I would say that by pursuing the Honora O'Neill agenda of showing we're competent and reliable in the areas that we're working in, that is the best way to get the trust of ministers uh, and not expect it to turn into the relationship that I had, for example, when I spent four years in a cabinet uh, as a personal advisor. I knew that that was a different uh, relationship uh, than the one that I have now with ministers, but it, it, mm. the current one is no less professional. Excellent. Um, I've got a set of people at the back, but I'm going to come just to reassure you, I've got you all clocked um, for that in a second, but I, there's just two or three people at the front who I still need to come to first. Alan. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Alan Budd former second permanent secretary. I don't think I've ever said that in my life before, but um, I enjoyed that ex very, very much indeed, and, and thanks very much, Martin. When you were describing the civil service, the, the impression I got of it was almost as a priestly cult, that here are people who know how you should be, behave, and there's a wonderful tradition of how you should behave, and you described it absolutely wonderful, wonderfully. And it also follows from that that the best judge of a civil servant is another civil servant that um because they know them when they when they see them and you touched a bit and, and it's also sue's question i think is related to this on the whole question of promotion that then the question does arise what part does the civil service play in that and what part do ministers play in that now if all ministers could give your speech then there's no problem but if they couldn't give your speech then there is a problem and and this is where we have seen tensions recently and i'd be very interested to hear how you see that and what you think the solution is uh, before you come back Thank on that, you, Rob. Just, uh, Very good. Uh, Rob Whiteman, Chief Executive of the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, uh, SIPFA, and I'm a former um, local authority Chief Executive as well as a senior civil servant. I must say, Martin, as a, a former Chief Executive of UK Border Agency, I like the bit uh, where you said officials shouldn't be in the public eye. Yeah. I, had, <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought that was great. Um, <laughs> Is there perhaps a very deft thing that you did in that 90% of what you said was about the independence of policy advice and the role for a safe space? But then towards the end, you sort of lumped that in with automatically, therefore, being the accounting officer and reporting the money and also being the person that manages the department. And if you lump all those things in together... Is there a risk that actually you're creating quite bad governance? I can't think of an example in the public or the private sector where the person giving the advice is also the person who runs the organisation, is also the person that formally reports the accounts. And by maintaining the status quo, is the space that you speak of maybe a little bit too safe? And compared to some other systems, like, I don't know, the much lauded New Zealand system or the others that we all quote, of course there's a role for independence and a safe space, but the financial implications or the risks of a proposal are independently scored and made more public, or the implementation and the management risks of proposals are, again, more public at inception to stop bad decisions being made.
and that maybe what you're doing in, in maintaining the status quo is that actually, do you know what? The system is changing, but it's going to change by stealth rather than design. And we end up in a system where if things go well, well done to the minister. And if things go badly, it's because the civil service doesn't have the capability to deliver it. And we're not discussing whether the right decision was made at inception and whether or not management risks or financial risks were transparent enough because all of those roles are being carried out by one person in a way that actually is quite unique. Okay. And just one final one, just there. Adam Steinhaus, uh, former civil servant. I'd like to follow up a couple of the preceding contributions by asking you quite, well, I guess quite directly, to what extent you think your policy colleagues share your definition of a specific Whitehall culture. I'm asking you that because, I mean, I was not a senior civil servant, but I had a lot of contact with them in my day, and, and I, I'm thinking of recruitment. A lot of the people I came in contact with had been recruited from the private sector who did not necessarily share the same definition of, say, a common good, at least that I had, and also did not ever do any training. And it follows up directly the part of the question that you did not ask, uh, answer from Bernard Jenkin, because that training has disappeared. Okay. Thank you. Martin, another, another Right, set. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Alan, uh, well, <laughs> you know, there is a risk, inevitably, in, in setting out what is a strong and well-entrenched culture that, you know, it starts to become a little bit too uh, <coughs> self-satisfied or, or just self-sufficient. And I think one former cabinet secretary about 60 years ago said he wished there was a senior common room for all of the uh, senior officials to go and, and, and meet in. Um, I think we've moved away from that, uh, rightly. And I'd stress two, two uh, important issues to deal with that ever-present challenge. One is our focus on diversity. Uh, we have made some progress, there is more to do. I'm uh, proud of the fact that my executive team uh, is uh, more than half uh, female and uh, they actually have the policy jobs. Um, but, you know, th that's not true through all of my organisation yet uh, and there are wider diversity issues which we are still grappling with uh, and we are trying to do things about. And that is one way to produce a better uh, more, more effective, more open and inclusive organisation. Um, the second, I think, is, and this is a personal view, but I found having non-executive directors extremely useful, challenging, um, supportive, and giving us insights into how other good organisations run things. So since they have a very clear role in assessing, certainly permanent secretaries, and I think increasingly feeding into uh, how other senior civil servants are viewed, I think that also helps to prevent us just photocopying ourselves. I think it's very important and uh, I can see the effect that it's had. Uh, and it's also tapping on a fund of goodwill, uh, which I, I hope we don't abuse, but which I think has really added significantly to our uh, capability. Um, on uh, the sort of, yeah, Rob, lumping things together, and sometimes I think I'd be very happy, you know, not to be a county officer, or as the old joke goes, you know, as permanent secretary, you're responsible for everything that goes wrong, and ministers are responsible for all the good bits. And there is rightly some, some, some truth in that. Uh, I think we have made some progress in being clearer with uh, Parliament about large projects, about reporting, and so on. And I think that is to the good. We've made a lot of progress inside government over a significant number of years now uh, in things like gateways, actually checking where projects are, what's happened, learning lessons, and we've got a better culture to do that. Part of that culture does require people to feel uh, safe, not in the sense they can do whatever they like, but in the sense that if they behave decently and professionally, uh, they will be protected. And I, I would emphasise that because I know it's an issue for people who find themselves in these exposed posts. And, and I would say there was a lot of legitimate... Um, exposure to Parliament in various ways around these. I just separate that from uh, a wider role because I think once you move to a wider role, and I don't think either Australia or New Zealand colleagues I talked to would say that they've cracked this, um, you start raising questions about overall ministerial accountability or financial accountability. So I think it's, it's a good challenge to our system 
but I think it does have a coherence which we shouldn't lightly put aside. That's all I would, I, I would say. And it certainly doesn't feel safe from inside, let me tell you, when uh, things are going uh, wrong. Um, I do want to come back on the behaviours uh, uh, point. I, I don't think it's for me to talk on behalf of uh, anybody else, uh, frankly, at the moment. I would say that people I've seen coming in from outside are uh, evaluated against the values and behaviours of the department in which they work, like anybody else. And so there is a clear system people are coming into, and there's an element of challenge which you want, but on areas like, you know, how do we do things around here in terms of how we behave towards staff, towards each other, towards customers? Well, you know, those are issues that are determined inside the department against civil service norms, and it's right that there should not be compromise on that. I think the training point is a really, really important one, and I <laughs> and others are looking around for the best available training. I've just... I think I can say this. I, I, I've just agreed um, with one um, uh, person who had had a ministerial role uh, recently that this person will come and uh, help us role play incoming ministers at some point in the run up to the election because we need to practice. And of course, ministers have a whole different set of uh, approaches, but they do have certain things that they really, really want. And I want to make sure that we've practiced that before we get to the real thing. We've also found some leadership training, which has been used uh, on the high performance development uh, uh, training, which has got good feedback, which I'm in the process of trying to get used for more of the senior officials in my department. I'm sure others are doing the same, because we absolutely recognise that. And, but it's a difficult area. It's not just a tick box training area. You've got to take people where they are, and you've got to make them more themselves while engaging, you know, without saying, this is how you behave, because we all know it's not like that. And as you know, <laughs> ministers vary very much in their approaches, and we have to be able to deal with that professionally and effectively. Excellent. All right, I'll just go to the back, right in the corner there. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Stefan Stern. Um, you talked about challenge. I, I wonder, you, I, su I suspect you'll tell me that if a letter of direction has to be written, then that's a sign of failure and that something has gone wrong. But Will we look back in a year from now and ask why more letters of direction have not been written? I, I, I'm happy to be corrected. I'm not sure very many have been written at all since May 2010. I, I think there's none since May 2010. Yeah. I might be corrected on that. Um, quite a few in the previous Parliament. Um, uh, Peter Riddle, Director of the IFG. Uh, two points, Martin, if I might. Hmm. One, in, in your, your, your lecture, you talked about the public evidence of competence. Mm -hmm. And then you used the phrase, when the necessary communication to allow outsiders to assess that officials are working effectively has taken place. I wonder if you could expand on that. The second question is, and it goes back to some of the points raised earlier by Bernard and others, mm. which is the kind of combination of your duty to current ministers and what might describe as the permanent civil service, the system stewardship. That, that in a sense, it's been, it's been implicit there that you have a duty as a permanent secretary to so the kind of long-term health of the civil service and your department and so on, and that as well as what you're doing for Vince Cable as Secretary of State. That appears to become a little bit under challenge, and I just wonder how you, you would explore both those. And finally, just right at the front, Richard. Um, Richard Mottram, former uh, Permanent Secretary. Um, First an observation and then a sort of question. The observation is, if, if a minister wish, wishes to push a department in the, into accepting more risk than is reasonable, as judged by the department, that's fine, as you said. Of course, if the minister then goes out and blames the department uh, when it goes wrong, uh, that would not be a basis of trust, would it? So that might be a, 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 just a small observation about a, a potential problem. Uh, never happened to me, no. Uh, but actually, my, uh, certainly not. My, um, uh, my, question, uh, my question really relates to your presentation, which was excellent, described a model which was, sort of, and you began with a quote from Northcote Trevelyan, uh, and you described a model that sounded rather like Northcote Trevelyan, but actually, as we've gone on to discuss things, you have established that you operate within a department and a framework that is nothing like Northcote Trevelyan. So you described your board, which has lots of diverse people on it from different backgrounds and so on. We've talked about permeability. And I think the interesting question would be, therefore, do we have in place 
effective arrangements to ensure that in what is now the modern civil service, which should be permeable, including in the policy space, do we have effective arrangements in place for the training development of all the staff wh whenever they join? And you said we have a sort of set of implicit understandings about the framework in which we operate. Are implicit understandings enough? Okay. Let's take I'll take one more round after this, just so people out there know that uh, that deadline is coming, drinks await. But Martin, um, Thank you. These, these three again. Uh, well, uh, I think the answer, Stefan, is yet none yet. Um, I think one has to be entirely straightforward about this. The whole point of the direction approach is that there are circumstances in which ministers can perfectly, properly decide to overrule a value for money judgment. And it's a classic e transparency example of the two sides of the line. Uh, I can personally envisage situations where you know, I would not lose a moment's sleep over receiving a direction uh, in, in area A or B, having set out the issues and uh, absolutely understood what was happening. We tell Parliament and so on. Uh, there, are, there are other things where I might be rather more worried about what was going on, <coughs> and then I think the system is a safeguard, not so much for me as for the taxpayer. But it is a system everybody understands and I think has worked very well. Uh, and it's a good example of something we move away from at our peril. Because there is a boundary, you can argue about whether it's exactly in the right place, but you know, the system works, people know what happens if they take certain decisions and everybody gets on with it. And I think that is a good thing in various ways, not least financially. Um, evidence of effectiveness. Um, you can just remind me what the what the point around that was. Peter. Yeah. You say you talk about trust because the public is in Oh yeah. Uh, thank you. I, th I think on that, and I, 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 I was a little too implicit, I go with Anora O'Neill that it's not an issue of information. We put massive amounts of information out there, far too much really for anybody to, to, to get their heads around. The challenge is helping people to see the relevant information that knows what's going on. And you know, over ma many years now that there has been a move to use the internet <laughs> more effectively, I think we've probably got to make sure that people see uh, what information is relevant to what concerns them, as opposed to just all the information which we put out because somebody might want it. Uh, and so it's, I think it's a good challenge to us to say, you know, you can trust us, but if you want to know more about A or B, look here. You know, it's only three clicks away. And then if you still want to know more, well, there's a bit more, or you go in this direction. Um, but we think the key things that you want to be aware of are these ones. And we've got to, I think, get better at thinking into the the public and stakeholder mindset and saying, what do we need to tell them before they ask? Or what will they want to know in six months? And something that we're not very concerned about might concern them a lot. Well, how do we know? Well, you know, why don't we ask some people before we start what they're going to want to know and do more of that? And I think that's an area, uh, Richard, where we probably have moved quite a long way, but I would argue in the spirit of Northcote Trevelyan, for whom probably having uh, policy civil servants who been to grammar schools rather than public schools was rather a big step, you know, and so on. I mean, we have moved quite a long way. We won't go into women uh, or the fact that, you know, in at least one <laughs> department represented in this room, women still had to resign on marriage up until the 1970s. Uh, you know, so uh, I think there's more we have to do there, but I think it's consistent with the direction of travel. Um, and I, I don't myself see underlying difference between our wholehearted duty to current ministers and the long-term delivery of a system which is still there to support them in five or 10 or 15 years' time. It's a bit like in biz, you know, we're, we support sustainable growth. We're not really interested in a quick six-month um, uh, uh, peak. And I think ministers buy that as well, because most ministers are optimists and expect to be ministers for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, also because they are aware that what they are doing will have implications over the longer term, probably when they are no longer ministers. So I don't, you know, I, you, you can obviously come up with short-term, long-term tensions, but I think it's part of the shared implicit, and maybe we need to make it more explicit covenant mm -hmm. 
understanding between politicians and officials that we do need to keep the show on the road in the medium term. We do need to invest in training, in, in skills, in flexibility, in, in IT, but also in an approach which recognises the world does not stop in 10 months' time or whatever. Um, and, and so, Richard, I think I, I would respectfully argue that um, we aren't that far from the inspiration of Northcote Trevelyan, which is why I liked their adjectives or adverbs at the start. I think they would recognise what we were trying to do and broadly how we were trying to do it. Um, and I think they'd agree that it was still important. The risk point, risk and blame, is one we've got to watch, yes. Uh, ministers have responsibilities, so do civil servants. You know, we mustn't just say, here are 17 risks, we've told you about them now, so if anything happens, it's not our fault. And you know, we all know the difference between adding value on dealing with a challenge and just saying, here it is. So I think we have to have mature conversations about that, knowing that probably none of us are perfect and nobody gets it right all the time, but at least we know what good looks like. And I think the Northcott Trevelyan system does give us a framework within which we can see what good should look like. Awesome. Right, and just take another set. If I can ask people just to keep their contributions brief, because I've got about five or six people who want to come in. Uh, we will, as an institute, be taking forward all these debates uh, at later points. Uh, right at the back, the lady, no, the lady just there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Dushevsky. I write a column for The Independent and also um, for The Guardian. Um, I have to say that as an outsider, um, it did <coughs> come across to me awfully as quite a self-contained system um, in which you decide um, what constitutes competence um, and then you judge it accordingly. Um, I also um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite wary of any sentence that starts um, with the envy of the world um, in anything, um, including the management, uh, the honest man management of public money, um, because I think that is at least questionable. Um, I wondered whether you could maybe give an example of um, a policy that either you have been involved in or you know about that has gone from um, the first discussions, um, the pros and cons, to a successful resolution. Um, we've had plenty of examples of non-successful ones, West Coast Mainline being one of them. Um, I wondered whether you could give an example of the other side. And then, stay on. Thanks. Um, Ursula Brannan, Ministry of Justice. Martin, you, you said you wanted to talk a bit about policy, and people talk a lot actually more these days about implementation than they do about policy. I think we've put lots of systems in place to help us get better at implementation and actually to judge whether we're doing it well. And I think some of those systems actually help with the Bernard Jenkin problem about whether people are confident to challenge, because those systems help you to be able to say, this is what good looks like. Do you think part of our problem is that we've, we've all got slightly different ideas about what good policy making looks like? Okay. Um, just the gentleman just in front there. Um, Hugh Leslie, Treasury. Um, I'm interested in what you think the line is between um, uh, department institution policy officials um, informing their advice from a starting point from experience and understanding of the evidence um, on the one hand, and then, and then on the other side, perhaps um, policy advice that, that's informed by kind of orthodoxy or even group thing that can build up. And I wonder if sometimes that, that distinction might be behind some of difficulties with transitions, for example. I know we're building up quite a few, but I just want to bring in Simon and then. Um, Simon Judge, Department for Education. Um, Martin, you've wandered around quite a large uh, number of parts of our constitution, both. Uh, written uh, and implicit. Uh, one bit you haven't touched on is the, the ministerial code, what used to be known as QPM. Just wondered if you thought there are any issues there that might need addressing as part of taking this agenda forward. That's great. And then if we just work our way across that row, lady in red first. Carla uh, Miller from Ashridge. Um, you told us that um, policy advice should be you know, based on evidence and values and this and the other. And also that we have to look at stakeholders. Now, I was actually wondering, to what extent are these lovely, wonderful, clever uh, civil servants in this beautiful, implicit culture, etc., cetera, um, open to or vulnerable to these very efficient lobbyists? Yeah. 
Thank you. And finally, the gentleman just left. Um, yes, Hartley Miller, Chester University. Um, I also had the feeling that we were talking very much internally in, this, in a part of the system, and I think we have to recognise that the system is not composed entirely of ministers and civil servants. Certainly, as far as policy is concerned, um, there's a wide spectrum of advice coming from all sorts of think tanks. Mm. Now, you did say, um, yes, you have to engage with experts. Um, I question whether always the experts are fully engaged with. I also wonder whether we are perhaps still in a North Court Trevelyan world um, of that old word, the generalist, um, who doesn't quite know how far to engage with the experts. I wonder whether that does uh, find some ex expression in the creation of the Office of Budget Responsibility um, as being a way in which um, the civil service is being almost sidelined. Do you think that there is scope for other offices of responsibility or parallel thinks, thinking? Yes, sir, thank you. I've set you a virtually impossible task there, Martin, with those, those questions. But maybe pick up on a few points that okay. seem most interesting uh, to you. Then. Thank you. If the questions go on, uh, go on getting uh, uh, better or staying very good, let me try to make some, some, some quick points on these. Mary, I'm afraid I just don't agree with you on honesty. Uh, and I just look at the evidence. Uh, when I talk to people around the world, they say unanimously that we have one of the, if not the most honest national government system that they know. Now, of course, it's not perfect, and of course, a lot of things happen, but, you know, I'm afraid when the evidence says that, it's reasonable to acknowledge it, um, and there are plenty of other areas where, you know, we can, we can rightly challenge ourselves. On competence, good challenge, I think I said it was about giving public evidence of competence, and that's how we gain people's trust, and that's where we have to use digital media as well as uh, parliamentary routes and so on, and it's our job to go out there and convince people on the basis of, of evidence that we uh, are working. I'd, I'd pick up your <laughs> non-successful and successful point. I mean, there's an element of subjectivity always here and an element of expectations. Um, with Ursula's point about, which I think is a really good and difficult one, how do we judge what good policy is? I was thinking about this and it's, you can actually make a case for almost any policy uh, that you may care to name and that you think is bad to, you know, to, to have had good points. The one and again, it's a purely personal point. If I look back over 25 years, I'm not convinced that the policy decision to separate the tracks and the trains uh, when uh, British Rail was uh, privatised uh, was necessarily, uh, w w was taking a risk with the evidence of, you know, 150 years of how people had run railways. But, you know, people had made a case that it produced transparency and, and, and so on. And there are always two sides to an argument. So... I think we have to recognise that deciding what... It, it's easy to say when you know, you're making bad policy, if you haven't looked at any evidence, you know, you've written it on the back of, uh, of a beer mat, you've announced it overnight, and all, all those things are likely to lead to less good policy making. But let's recognise that what good policy is, is a matter, and rightly so, uh, for uh, debate. And uh, you know, I think we can play our part in helping to make it better than it would otherwise have been. And perhaps that's where I would uh, leave that. Um, evidence, yeah, Hugh, uh, we, we've got to look at it. I think there is a risk of, of groupthink. In my experience, though, it comes from people saying too arbitrarily, ministers aren't interested in X without checking whether they were. And it's my point that you could at least ask them, you could say, you know, we think we're getting this wrong. Uh, we think that perhaps, you know, uh, there, there are issues around the cyclicality of tax revenues or whatever. Um, and that, that does happen, but it must happen. And we probably need most of all in the run-up to uh, elections, but at other times as well, to have people who will test us and say, you know, you, you all agreed on that, but hold on, you know, here's policy making in country X, which goes in a different direction. Have you really thought of that? Uh, and I think we do need that. Think tanks, uh, I think of us like celebrity chefs and we are trying to be the caterers. You know, you've got a basic budget and you've got to feed X hundred people every day on this. And someone comes along and says, you could make this wonderful dish with all these expensive ingredients. And you could. And it's worth thinking about that. But, you know, actually think tanks, I have to say, on one level, have it easy because they're only looking at one particular, uh, you know, bit of the menu. And that's fine. But let's be aware that pulling it all together 
with the resource constraints that we have is a key part of uh, the policy civil servant's job and somebody's got to do it and it means uh, difficult trade-offs and we've got to make them you know, as least difficult as we can. Um, stakeholders and lobbyists, absolutely. You know, I mean, we, we're not naive about this and, and we shouldn't be. And there comes a point when a stakeholder does become a lobbyist and that's another reason why I'd like people to think seriously about the importance of a private space where you can take account of where people are coming from without necessarily having to tell them everything in the middle of what may be a negotiation. Sometimes a negotiation about resources, sometimes about policy outcomes. Um, and I think we do engage with experts, but there is an expertise in public administration. And you both know that because you help to uh, teach and, and develop it. Uh, and I don't think the word generalist is a useful one, frankly. Uh, I think the job we do uh, is a very professional one when it's done well, and our job is to do it well, or at least to do it better all the time. And I think the skills of being uh, a public policy official uh, today uh, are ones which are actually valued by the market, but I think are also valued uh, by society. <coughs> our job, though, is to deliver for elected ministers, and that's the beginning and the end of it. It's just it's a different, complementary job. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Um, before we close, just one or two quick um, observations from me. I, I was going to say something and ask you something about how politicians could help you and indeed your Premsec colleagues do their jobs better. Um, quite interestingly, we track something called the Permanent Secretary Objectives. I think you've got 19 by our count, which is pretty short of the top one, which is 34. Um, now, when I talk to civil servants, they do tend to say that politicians put a lot into these sorts of things and want to see the Christmas tree approach of seeing your own thing there. But I think it might be nice to actually see our politicians step up to the plate and say, if we want people to do serious jobs, we should give them serious objectives which they're capable of meeting that the rest of the world might recognise. The other observation I have on this, uh, this event is just how much the diversity of views in the room, which I think goes straight to your heart of your point, there's no one view on these sort of things. This is an incredibly important debate, and many people in this room are part of that debate already. Mm. Um, I think it's been incredibly helpful to have you come and set out from a Serum Civil Servant's point of view how you feel the system is reflecting on your experience. And I think we'll definitely be hoping to take forward this debate um, using this as almost a kick-off to some of these issues. I'm very conscious that we could have had a, a session on most of the questions that were asked just in and of itself. Um, so, with that comment that there is plenty of time, starting over drinks outside, uh, to take all these sort of issues forward, can I just thank you on behalf of the audience for an excellent present speech and very <laughs>